What is the composition of a black show? In and of itself, that ass so. Many questions infinitely bending and eventually breaking rules that define the status quo. Taking looks, drilling down in books, how far does it go? Turn it up and listen while we examine the facts, though. Strapped with a heavyweight that make the screens crack, bro. Misunderstanding the last line is exactly why this show should be your pastime. Prime time, exacto. Open up your mind, time. Team Black got our mean track record of being nice when tracking records on a media device, second to none. The docket is about a rocket on course to explode. With reasonable mind force plus four, we just begun. Discussions over what should be done. It's your What's going on, folks? We are back. This is a black show, and I am your host, Elon James White. Thanks for all the love that you guys have shown us for our first episode, and I hope that we can continue this magic train moving on. So, this past week, um, I, I don't know where to start. So we have the racist rich guy, Don Sterling, who owns a team of Negroes, the LA Clippers, but he doesn't like it when his half-Negro mistress hangs out with other Negroes and posts pictures about it. I mean, that's reasonable. Negroes are scary. I mean, just look at me. Aren't you terrified right now? Ooh, and then we have radio host and comedian D.L. Hughley who was mocking a woman who was alleging that her husband, scandal star Columbus Short, had abused her and that basically all she was was some sort of thirsty bitch or thirsty hoe. I mean, again, that's reasonable. At least D.L. is standing up for truth. I mean, come on. What man has ever abused a woman? And then I almost forgot about Clive and Bundy, who's stealing from the federal government, but he's claiming that he's fighting for freedom or something, and he also has some words about the Negroes that he just felt like he needed to share. I want to tell you one more thing I know about the Negroes. And because they were basically on government subsidy, and so now what do they do? They abort their, their young children, they put their young men in jail, because they never, they never learned how to pick cotton. And I've often wondered, oh, are they better off as slaves, picking cotton, having family life and doing things, or are they better off under government subsidy? And then he clarified those words. If I call, if I say Negro or black boy or uh, uh, a slave, I'm not, I'm not, uh, if those people cannot uh, take those kind of words and, and not be offensive, then Martin Luther King hasn't got his job done yet. I'm not gonna lie to you, reading the news as of late has been hard. I find myself constantly muttering to myself as I read these stories. Oh, so that's how Paul Ryan is going to tackle poverty. <laughs> this motherfucker right here. So you know what? New segment time. We're introducing the This Motherfucker Right Here of the Week. We'll ask our all-star commentators to weigh in on who they think deserves this wonderful distinction, and at the end of the show, we'll let you know who won. But up first, a little politricking. owner Donald Sterling has been all over the news for getting caught saying racist sexist things to his mistress that were recorded. So now the whole world knows that Donald Sterling doesn't really like black people that much. All I can think is that it's not news to me that old rich white racist men are racist. She doesn't like us at his games. When I found out that an 81 year old white millionaire billionaire who cheats on his wife with a half black girl had some serious hatred of black people, uh, black men in particular, I have to admit that I wasn't terribly surprised. He doesn't like us next to his girlfriend. He doesn't like us on Instagram. He surely loved that black pussy, didn't he? As a result of Sterling's most recent racist comments, he has been banned from the NBA for life, fined the maximum amount of $2.5 million, which will be donated to anti-discrimination and tolerance organizations, and he will possibly be forced to sell the team. When I first heard about Donald Sterling getting banned from the NBA, I couldn't believe that a side chick and TMZ combined to take down a billionaire. Welcome to 2014. I think the only thing that's been surprising about this whole situation is that the NBA has actually done something about it. I was banned from the NBA. I was banned from the NBA. I was actually really surprised that the NBA came down so hard on this owner. I was expecting only a financial fine. The $2.5 million is not that much, um, but apparently that's all that they can do based upon their constitution. But being banned for life and then forcing him to sell his team and voting him out, 
I did not expect that, NBA. Whether or not he is banned for life, the, the kind of like larger issues of institutional racism are still plaguing the NBA, so. Do I think it's enough? Absolutely not. I would have liked to see Donald Sterling stripped down naked, tossed into the woods, drenched in honey, smothered in dirt, then drenched in more honey, and then left out there for the bees and bears. But I suppose banned for life will have to do. Jolyn Kent, a reporter for Fox News, was possibly the only voice offering a defense for Donald Sterling at Tuesday's NBA press conference by asking, uh, should someone lose their team for remarks shared in private? Is this a slippery slope? You know, I understand what she's saying. It is a slippery slope. I mean, what if an owner said something homophobic or xenophobic or anti-Semitic or commits a crime? Should they be held accountable to the same standards that they do with the players already? Uh, what? Oh, actually, yes. Yes, they should. <laughs> I love the the analogy of slippery slope. That gets used a lot when people want to say, is this fucked up or not? No, I don't think it's like a slippery slope that he uh, is banned for life from the NBA or that people addressed it. And she wants to know if punishing a racist for comments said in private is a slippery slope. We can only hope so. We can only hope so. I think that everyone should be mindful of the fact that freedom of speech simply means that the government cannot come after you for your terribly bigoted, racist, homophobic, anti-female, trans, misogynistic uh, views. Uh, you're more than welcome to express them, but there will be social and professional consequences for you, especially if you're not an octogenarian billionaire. And for once, we saw that somebody who has all the power and all the access in the world actually was fallen by his words. If it can happen to you, him, it can certainly happen to your broke ass. All right, guys, I know the reporters from Fox and we throw shade all day long at their attempt at news on a daily basis. But what's really wrong with asking the question? I mean, there are some legal questions around this on this was a conversation shared in private, forcing him to sell his team. These are all legal issues. And so asking the question on whether or not this is a slippery slope and can be used against an owner, another owner in the future is a valid question. Look, man, if we're living in a world where a married man can't trust his mistress to hide his racism, then I don't want to own an NBA team either. This whole Don Sterling thing has been magically ridiculous. Even when you try to accept the whole idea of the racist old dude yelling at his black skin mistress about hanging out with other Negroes, even though he owns a team full of Negroes, and you try to absorb all of that racism, you almost forget about the magical amount of misogyny that's happening at the exact same time. I mean, come on, Don Sterling was making it rain. Raining patriarchy. And even in the middle of this magical convergence of assholicness, then you find out that the NAACP's LA chapter was going to give Sterling, a known racist, a second Lifetime Achievement Award. Don Sterling probably really liked the NAACP, you know? He's like, you guys say colored, I say colored. A second Lifetime Achievement Award. I am shocked. Wait, isn't this the same NAACP chapter that embarrassed themselves a few years ago? It is a graduation greeting from Hallmark. Hey world, we're officially putting you on notice! Yeah! Members of the Los Angeles NAACP did take notice. And as characters known as Hoops and Yo-Yo banter on, African American leaders hear demeaning language. And you black holes, you're so ominous! Mm -hmm. And you planets, watch your back. That was very demeaning to African American women where they made reference to African-American women as whores, and at the end says, watch your back. Hallmark, reached by phone, says it is all a misunderstanding. The card's theme is the solar system and the power of the grad to take over the universe, even energy-absorbing black holes. R in there, not whores, and not holes. The R is in there. It sounds like a group of children laughing and joking about blackness. The card maker says the card has been out for three years. This is the first time they've received a complaint, as their message is clear. And we do not want to see this ever, ever again. That's the only reason why I want an NAACP membership right now, so that I can throw random ass press conferences. 
I can't even get mad at the LA chapter or the NAACP because obviously they've been out of their damn minds for years. Then the conversation took yet another turn. Before the NBA had finished its investigation and levied its punishment against Sterling, folks were demanding that the Clippers players just tap out of the playoffs completely until something was done to Sterling. So widely known rich racist dude gets caught being racist by his mistress in a power struggle and then the players who have been practicing half of their lives to get to this point of a championship need to tap out because Please understand that I actually believe in sacrifice and I appreciate those who sacrificed before me to allow me to be where I am today. But I find it problematic that when racists are shown to be racist, that then black people have to then sacrifice in order to fix the racism problem as opposed to everyone else dealing with that racist themselves. I mean, there was one article that was titled, Black People Are Cowards. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have a problem with critiquing or attacking people of color who are actually victims to racism because they don't go do something extraordinary to go fight the racism that was put upon them. Hey, hey Negroes, why aren't you being like those extraordinary Negroes in the books about extraordinary Negroes? You are failing your entire people by not being extraordinary. Negro. Seriously, do you think it was easy for those players to walk into that stadium and just have to play through even though they know that their owner believes these horrible, horrible things about them? I mean, yeah, it would have been awesome if the players would have thrown middle fingers up and demanded something be done of Sterling, but you know what? I'm not a basketball player and I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what would have happened to them if they would have actually done that. Hell, Sterling has been told flat out he needs to sell the team and he's already pushing back saying he's not going to do it and everyone keeps talking about how litigious this dude is. I mean, was everyone who was demanding them tap out going to come in and help back them up? And I mean, not just with good job, I mean with some money and some, and some backing, like serious backing. <laughs> Maybe they would have got some support from the NAA, psych! I believe in standing up for justice. I don't believe in judging those who don't have the strength to because you know what? None of us should have to. But up next, I sit down with Jamila Lemieux, the senior editor of Ebony.com, and we discuss how to have a message and yet still play the media game. Check it out. So we've had this conversation offline before about people wanting to use basically the platform that you have. If you like a lot of folks uh, who do have a bigger platform, they're a part of bigger spaces. Uh, they are sometimes questioned about how they use those spaces in, I guess, in the fight, in the fight, in the revolution, you know what I mean? Uh, and then they get mad at you uh, when you don't publish that article they sent you that has uh, three pages of no line breaks, uh, and uh, they didn't actually run a spell check through it. And I imagine you might catch some of that as a senior editor over at Ebony.com. I do, you know, and I'm appreciative and, and grateful for anyone who's interested in contributing to, you know, our site and our brand's legacy. But, you know, unfortunately, I do have to exercise certain discernment, editorial standards, and I won't be able to run your 8,000 word essay on why the Willie Lynch letter is as uh, valuable today <laughs> as it was when it was written 500 years ago. <laughs> And and, and, and and it's something to be uh, to note here that, yes, at the moment you're a senior editor over at Ebony.com, but you were a blogger for a while before you ever got over uh, to Ebony. And oh. you followed, you had to learn how to write in that way, and like in a way that would be acceptable in order to get a certain message across. Absolutely. You know, uh, before I, I wrote for a lot, there was a, a point where I felt like I was writing for almost every black website on the internet. Um, and kind of as somebody who was self-taught, I, I had to learn how to communicate with editors and how to write for diverse audiences, how to rein my thoughts in. You know, the 1,500 word blog posts will be better received as a 500 word article if you're going to a larger mainstream site. Um, there's an adjustment to it. And I think that because some of us have come from blogging, there's an expectation that all of us can come from blogging and, and become professional writers. And there's simply not enough opportunities available for that to happen. And but like, for instance, uh, when, for, when you did this, you like you said, you came from blogging, but you started uh, you wrote for all the, uh, all the black sites, which I feel like a lot of times uh, uh, as uh, as black writers and stuff like that, we all have like that, 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 that round of websites that we all did. Like, because like, like, hey, fifty dollars better than no dollars. Uh, <laughs> you just had to get you got your articles in and you got paid. Uh, but 
there's there's a thing there's a transition that happens and sometimes people feel as if uh, one they don't need to transition and two they don't want to actually pay the dues in the independent space you know what I mean like you don't get to just jump up and, and start writing at Ebony you know what I mean you uh, you write and you grind and you write and, and you grind and you get feedback and you accept that and you uh, you learn from it and that seems to be sometimes lost in the conversation when people get really mad at spaces uh, uh, that are not their own. Absolutely. You know, if I wrote the way now that I did 10 years ago, uh, when I first started doing this, then I wouldn't have the career that I have now. Um, you know, there's certainly something to be said of hard work and earning your place. And that doesn't mean that there's someone who has only been writing for six months and just has a fantastic voice and, and command of language and knowledge of the digital space where they can jump in and you know, receive certain things that I wasn't able to get my first six months in. But, you know, I don't think that anyone should look at the democracy of the Internet as, you know, a, a pathway away from hard work. And the people who you see who have editorial positions um, or who, you know, are able to sustain, to sustain their lifestyle as professional writers um, after being bloggers, they worked really hard to get what they have. I know that I have. So, you know, it's not something that's going to be handed to you. And just because your thoughts and ideas are valid and important, as everyone's are, that doesn't mean that you should be a professional writer necessarily. But, you know, Twitter and Facebook and the blogosphere and Tumblr, they give you an opportunity to share your thoughts and feelings with the world. So maybe you're not able to compel a check, but that doesn't mean that you can't share these things that you're passionate about with lots and lots of people. Bill O'Reilly is concerned about black teens and he blames Beyonce. But she knows, this right. woman knows, that young girls getting pregnant in the African American community now, it's about 70% out of wedlock. She knows and doesn't seem to care, Ebony. That's my problem Bill with her. Bill O'Reilly has been coming for Beyonce for ages, and no one has sent for him. I'm glad that I have Fox News to worry about uh, my needs and concerns as a black person. This is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. We all know how much Bill cares about the black community. If these teens are out there getting pregnant, then who's going to take care of Bill's kids? In fact, if you actually look at the statistics, Black teen pregnancy has been on a steady decline for the last 25 years. She's a 32-year-old mother of one who likes to have sex with her husband, who she loves very much. And her first solo album came out in 2003. Since then, black teen pregnancy has declined 32%. On the one hand, Bill O'Reilly thinks that she's encouraging teens to get pregnant and promoting sex before marriage. And on the other hand, in some spaces, she's being criticized for respectability and promoting getting married and then having a baby. In fact, even further, Black teen pregnancy has been the only among every ethnic group that has been steadily declining. So if anything, Bill O'Reilly, Beyonce is stopping teen pregnancy. Reality is 95% of Americans have had premarital sex. And if you go back 50 years, 95% of Americans then had premarital sex. Why do all black celebrities have to be cultural leaders? The album already has an explicit sticker on it. She did her job. He continues to blame Beyonce for being I don't know, Beyonce, sexy, hot, for getting his dick hard. I, I'm, con I'm confused about the issue and why the blame falls on her. I need Bill O'Reilly to stop concerning himself with what he calls the black cultural deficit and focus on the white cultural deficit. For example, Rush Limbaugh's out there popping Oxycontin like Pez candy and no one ever talks about that. Wait, didn't Bill O'Reilly think that black people order their iced tea like Def Jam comics? There wasn't one person in Sylvia's who was uh, screaming, mf -er, I want more iced tea. <laughs> Please. You know, I mean, it, everybody was, uh, it was like going into an Italian restaurant in an all-white suburb in the sense of people were sitting there and they were ordering and having fun and there wasn't any kind of craziness at all. Yeah, yeah, huh, huh. Yeah, yeah.
But at the same time, you obviously are someone who has certain opinions. You are you 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 uh, believe in certain things. You you you're a feminist. You're anti-racist. You uh, deal with all these different spaces. And so in doing that, you people expect certain things from you. They expect for you to like uh uh, uh to basically jump out in something and sometimes be uh, uh, uh make the emotional argument as opposed to the uh the I guess uh, I guess the best way of saying it is the the fact-based argument. The uh, the idea of using uh, 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 facts and history to make an argument as opposed to a mad son and he races again. Like, how do you like deal with that? Because you obviously that's that's a line you have to walk, right? and, and you also probably feel emotion around these things. Absolutely, you know. So often the internet can be a very dangerous game of telephone. So if somebody tweets me and, and says that Barack Obama went on TV and, and, you know, said that feminists are the worst thing that could have ever happened to the black community, I can't react to that. I have to go find out if he actually said it. You know, I need evidence and proof. And a lot of times there's an expectation that, hey, I like you. I read your writing. I support you. I need, you know, you should support exactly what I believe in, exactly what I thought. And it doesn't necessarily work that way. And sometimes there are things that have happened and there is proof. And I have to just, you know, skirt the issue, handle it delicately, handle it professionally. And, you know, that's not always easy for people that are outside of the professional media world to understand. Um, I'm not restricted as other people might be in spaces that are not black owned. I, I've been given a lot of freedom uh, to speak my mind and I've been supported, uh, believe it or not when I do speak my mind, but, you know, I would just hope that anyone who's watching or who's looking for me to kind of be their mouthpiece should be mindful of the fact that, you know, I have a brand to protect. I have my own livelihood and that of my child to protect and I have a career and, you know, I, I can't just go off the rails and get mad at somebody because it seems like a good time to go off the rails and get mad at somebody. Now, it's interesting that you say that because a lot of conversation that was just happening recently was around the fact that people thought that the Clippers didn't do enough when they, uh, uh, for after this whole Sterling uh, issue and that they should have got out there and they should have uh, they shouldn't have played at all they should, uh, and stood up or whatever. And uh, the argument I, which I made actually uh, was that uh, these people have families. You can't you can't just you can't demand sacrifice from people uh, or take hits because uh, things are messed up. And uh, it's it's similar in spaces when you have a position like you like like prime example. I'll tell you right now, I get tweets, uh, like uh, direct messages all the time from people in uh, wider media spaces who can't say something. They, they, they feel it, and they're like, I'm mad about this, son. And they, I, people actually will bring me stuff to go ham about because they know I can do it. Absolutely. You know, and I had that experience. I, I still get it from time to time, but especially before, you know, I was here uh, and, and editing full time for a publication like this, you know, that you can be, can you be my, what's the uh, character on Key and Peele, the other Obama? Right? <laughs> oh, it's, it's anger interpreter or interpreter or something? Yes, yes. I can be your anger interpreter, you know, because you're not able to publicly say the things that you think, feel, or believe. Um, you know, to the Clippers thing, beyond just it being kind of unreasonable to expect a group of mostly millennial athletes to all of a sudden become Muhammad Ali overnight, knowing what we know about today's NBA and what what we know about today's professional athletes. And that's not a shot at them. It, it's a generational problem that we don't have a, a league full of Muhammad Ali's who can stand up and take, you know, a stance. We don't know who on that team for all the millionaires. There's somebody who's still barely making his mortgage. So, Overall, what, what tips would you give people who have a message? They want to say something. They want to get their ideas out there, and they don't know how. And so that's why they, they go to uh, people with bigger platforms and get mad and demand that they play, uh, play that game. Could you give tips on how to get, make your platform bigger and engage people in a way that will allow for your words to get out there more? Yeah, I mean, I think that what you and I have been able to do is really use social media to get people viewing our blogs and the things that we did, you know, for our own properties and for other people. You know, be compelling. Take some time and care with your writing. Your ideas and your views could be fantastic and totally spot on. But if it's so wrought with grammatical errors that, you know, like you said, no page breaks, um, that we can't read them, then they're going to be lost on people. And you're not going to have any opportunities to do anything for anyone else. You know, don't be a troll. Don't be a spam bot on Twitter sending links to your work to 
you know, anybody you know who has a following, you know, have some savvy. If you need to buy a book on how to sell your blog, buy the book on how to sell your blog. Uh, I think that what has really dominated in this space in terms of people being able to make careers here is that personality. You know, are you insightful? Are you thoughtful? Are you witty? Do people enjoy talking to you offline? Uh, and if that, if that can't be said of you and of your work, then that's something that you should take some attention to and, and work on before expecting to be published or hired by anyone else. Indeed, ma'am. I, I, I agree. And thank you so much for uh, dropping uh, this wisdom on folks. I hopefully uh, people will uh, pay attention to that uh, and not write you a bunch of evil uh, emails about how uh, you don't know what you're talking about, lady. Um, and I don't want your Willie Lynch pitch. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I swear to God, I don't want it. I swear to you know what? I'm sending you a Willie Lynch pitch. I'm telling you right now. I'm, I'm doing it. I don't know what I'm. I'm not, I'm not sure my angle yet, but it's gonna be. It's gonna be really interesting. I'm, I'm gonna somehow make it about Willie Lynch, but at the same time, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, 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 about how House Negroes and Willie oh, Lynch came together, right? And yes. then I'm gonna talk about the ancient Cometians. No, I'm kidding. All right, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I'm about to get. I'm about to get hate mail. I don't need that in my life. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. 42-year-old Texas teacher was arrested for giving one of her 15-year-old students a full contact lap dance in front of the class. According to Fox News' Tucker Carlson, America needs to lighten up. So, you know, I, I think legitimate opinion divides whether this was appropriate for the classroom or not. Oh, there's a 15-year-old yeah. kid and then you have a no. grown-up teacher. There's a 15-year-old boy. 15 so, so having been a 15-year-old boy, I can tell you, unless there's something we don't know about this, this kid's life has not been I have He's taught that if your daughters have this happen well, to them, how would you feel? Bingo. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, what's the difference? See? The difference is they're girls, and girls react differently to this kind of thing. Damn it! I just said that Fox said something reasonable. His idea that it's okay for a woman in her mid-40s to give a child a lap dance in front of other students because he's a boy and it's okay is, is very problematic. And when I first heard the news, I was like, oh, I hope it's not a black person. Um, and it was. I have to admit that I'm surprised that Tucker Carlson doesn't see anything wrong with a female teacher existing, let alone giving a student a lap dance. So Tucker Carlson thinks it's okay for teachers to lap dance uh, on their male students, but not okay on their female students. He's a Republican. That's progress. You know, I was once a 15-year-old boy as well. And apparently, Tucker Carlson still is. So I wonder what Tucker Carlson would have to say about all the priest abuse cases. I guess he wouldn't mind if a 15-year-old got rogered by a priest. After all, he could just suck it up and take it like a woman, silently. Tucker Carlson needs to have every seat. The problem with this way of thinking is that we have so many young boys that are sexually harassed or assaulted or molested and they never say anything because people are telling them that this is what you should want as a boy and this makes you a man. It doesn't make them men. It makes them really hurt and abused boys and we've got to stop this. And the winner of the TMFRH of the week goes to... Dio Hughley. My vote for this motherfucker right here of this week. I picked Dio Hughley. Ding, ding, ding. Dio Hughley, congratulations, you idiot. This motherfucker right here of the week, DL Hughley. Uh, this is quite a challenging contest, but I have to give it to DL Hughley. This motherfucker right here has had some problematic views on black women for years. I listened to the clip from his show. I didn't get what the joke was, and every time he was given factual information, he dismissed it so he could further rant about how this was somehow all the victim's fault for domestic violence. Congrats, DL Hughley. You are this motherfucker right here of the week. So this week, I'm going to have to go with DL Hughley. I'm going with DL Hughley. Well, Mr. Hughley, you've managed to do something so despicable that it's not funny. I can't make a joke. There's no punchline. If for no other reason than I think the other two are completely beyond repair and saving. And DL, if by any chance you hear this, you can and should and owe it to us to be better than calling the alleged victim of domestic violence a thirsty bitch. I don't want you to do better. I want you to be off air. How dare you go on a radio show and sit there and talk about 
black women being abused as though it's some kind of joke. And you just cackling and laughing, acting like it's funny. Now, maybe calling the police will result in Col Columbus Short losing his paycheck and cutting off all of the money for his wife. But isn't that better than him actually cutting her with the knife he had in his hand? You know, cutting her actual life short? D.L. Hughley is a fucking idiot. I don't know. Did you want something more nuanced than that? One in four women experience domestic violence in their lives. Millions are injured every year, and over a thousand women die every year from domestic violence. So my question to Mr. Hewley is what does he do when he gets that dreaded phone call from one of his own daughters after a man has put his hands on her? Thanks for watching, folks. And remember to send your comments to a black show at freespeech.org and let us know what you think on Twitter and on Facebook. You can find us at a black show with Elon James White on Facebook and at Twib Nation and at Elon James. Thank you guys for watching. Have a pleasant evening.